Hangman Jack Ketch was a rogue and a liar who, in the year 1718, was himself hanged for the brutal murder of a woman in London, not so merry at the time, England. Welcome to Crimes from History. During the early 18th century, the world was in a state of flux. The war of Spanish succession raged across Europe as we all tried to get our sticky fingers on the Spanish throne following the death of childless Charles II of, well, Spain. Pirates were causing havoc en masse in the Indian Ocean, the North American Eastern Seaboard, the West African Coast and the Caribbean, like the films. And revolution was in the air for the French. But it didn't stop them going to the theatre, as Voltaire's first play, Oedipus, was a roaring success in Paris. Paris. Awkwardness for all the family. Mass migration continued as Europeans colonised the Americas, and here in the United Kingdom, solicitor James Puckle had clearly had enough as he invented the world's first machine gun. And in May 1718, ne'er-do-well and former executioner Jack Ketch rounded off his crappy life by being hanged. But I'm skipping ahead. Let's start right at the beginning, 40 years earlier. Jack, quote, peeped from the shell, which is the most adorable 1700s way of saying he was born, in a miscellaneous poverty-stricken suburb of London. His parents couldn't afford to educate him, so age seven he became a student at the School of Hard Knocks, learning from the streets how to steal for a living. He was quite a natural and, by all accounts, had quite a talent and passion for elaborate swearing. That was quite a tirade, Jen. It would have been even worse if Paul hadn't been so quick on the profanity buzzer. You fucked up! Something else he had a passion, yet no talent for, was lying. He'd frequently be caught out and reprimanded for telling porky pies, a trend that would continue throughout his life. At age 18, he secured legitimate employment with the High Sheriff of the County of Essex, whose job it was to maintain law and order in the area. High Sheriff is a position still in use, though it's ceremonial these days, and they inexplicably continue to wear this. It's likely that Jack would have worked in the household or grounds in a servant's role. Unfortunately, so prolific was his habit of lying, Jack ended up losing the job on account of all his fibs. On holiday in Spain one year, me and my mate took a pedlo out and we went to Africa. Do you think you could spare us the bullshit for one minute? He returned to thieving. That same year, he was apprehended by a group of citizens near Brentwood in Essex, where he was caught stealing 18 shillings, about a fiver in today's money, from a market woman. A magistrate committed him to Chelmsford Jail, and pleading guilty, he received a sentence of death, which may seem extreme, but people were certainly executed for less back then. Some examples of crimes you could be executed for in 1700s England include cutting down trees, stealing goods worth 25p, and stealing from a rabbit warren. I didn't know rabbits had anything worth stealing. <laughs> Let's just say, what with disease, poverty, and a very hard line on crime, it was pretty easy to die back then. That should have been the end of the story, if not for Jack's former employer, the high sheriff in his silly trousers, who, taking pity on him, addressed the court saying he knew Jack to be such an unaccountable liar that there was no believing one word he said. So, his pleading guilty was, in his opinion, an eminent sign of his innocence. What a backhanded defence, but one that saved Jack's life. As the saying goes, it's not what you know, but who, or whom. A lucky escape for young Jack Ketch, who repented his sins and went on to live a wholesome and philanthropic life. I'm kidding, of course he didn't. Instead, he joined a gang of pickpockets with whom he gallivanted up and down the country until one day he got caught sticking his fingers where they didn't belong. Oh, that sounded wrong. He was caught pickpocketing, I mean, and ended up being committed to Newgate Prison, though not the notorious London Newgate. This was Newgate in Bristol, not as famous, but just as unpleasant. He was sentenced to a severe lashing, which he took like a champ and was then released. From there, he went to sea, first getting work aboard a merchant ship, then on a couple of men of war. However, he couldn't help but help himself to other people's stuff and was caught on numerous occasions stealing from his fellow shipmates. The customary punishment of lashing, which was usually enough to halt unsavoury behaviour on board any ship, didn't seem to curb Jack's almost pathological need to steal, so the captain had to invent more elaborate ways for him to learn his lesson. If you're not really into hearing methods of torture, skip to this timestamp to spare yourself all the gory details. I don't blame you. 
The rest of you sickos, let's get on with it. One method of punishment the captain adopted was to have Jack's lashing wounds soaked in brine. Ouch. Another was something called keel hauling, a process of torture feared by sailors and pirates alike. The victim would be suspended by a rope from the mast of the ship with a weight, usually a cannonball or some chains, attached to his legs. Crew members would let go of the rope and the victim would be dragged underwater along the underside or keel of the ship. Now, ship's bottoms are rarely smooth. They're generally encrusted with thick, jagged barnacles, which would cause horrendous lacerations, sometimes even amputating the limbs of the victim. It wasn't always intended as a death penalty, but more often than not, survival was, eh, unexpected. Not just by drowning or bleeding to death, but there was a high chance of fatal infection of the wounds after the fact. Essentially, keel hauling is death by a thousand cuts with a touch of waterboarding thrown in for good measure. Jack survived these brutal punishments. He's actually doing a really good job of staying alive considering everything he's gone through. The captain threw a seemingly invincible Jack off the ship as soon as they docked in Portsmouth and he limped to his hometown of London. There he joined a gang of footpads. Footpads were essentially highwaymen but without the horse as horses were expensive, so they would team up to incite greater fear in their victims. Because they didn't have the benefit of a quick escape, footpads were generally more violent than highway robbers on horseback and worked at night so they could slip into the shadows and disappear. One cold night in Hampstead, the gang divided themselves into three groups and hid among the trees along various points of a road that cut through the heath. I suppose the point of this would be to rob multiple travellers at the same time, but this night it seems they unknowingly ended up robbing one poor fellow three times. They don't seem like the brightest bunch. Ruprecht, don't take the cork off the fork. Why is the cork on the fork? To prevent him hurting himself and others. Oh. The man in question was a solicitor. Quite why he was walking through somewhere so notorious for highway robbery at night alone, I don't know. Anywho, the first group jumped out at him, pistols drawn, and in true footpad fashion violently demanded he turn over his money. He gave them what loose change he had, and they turned him loose. Thankful to have escaped unscathed, he continued his way along the road, and it wasn't long before the second gang jumped out and demanded his possessions. What are the chances? Robbed twice in one night. He told them he had just been held up at the cruel hands of another gang. Cruel, answered one of the footpads. How durst you use these terms? And who made you so bold as to talk to us with your hat on? Saying that, they snatched his hat and wig off his head and took a diamond ring off his finger, which the other lot had completely missed, apparently. He had one job, thieves. The downtrodden and now chilly-headed solicitor went on his way. Still some distance from his destination, he briefly considered turning back, but didn't want to run into those idiots again, so continued on, only to be jumped a third time. Jesus, I could do a better job at robbing people than this. In this third group was Jack, and hearing the solicitor's claim of having been targeted twice already that night, he searched the man and found nothing of any worth. Instead of letting him leave with the nugget of dignity he had left, the gang took the solicitor's clothes, telling him how lucky he was to leave with his life, and he scampered off shivering into the night. Poor guy. It's the first time I've ever felt sorry for a solicitor. After a brief search, the footpads were captured, and Jack was thrown into Newgate Prison in London this time for petty larceny. Again, he was lashed, but managed to raise enough money to obtain his liberty. Finally, sick of being imprisoned and whipped, imprisoned, whipped, dragged under boats, imprisoned, whipped, Jack endeavoured to improve his fortunes by getting married. He wed a lady called Betty, Betty, who happened to work at Newgate running errands for prisoners. Through her, he was able to use his charms and hobnob with some of the prison bigwigs who offered him the position of hangman for the county of Middlesex. Oh, I don't know, is that a step up? It's definitely a drop down. On his first day, he got drunk in the pub and managed to get his burning irons picked out of his pocket. Karma. He most likely would have had these burning irons for, oh god, branding thieves as part of his job. So he'd heat up the iron and put it on the perpetrator's skin, which would scar to leave a permanent reminder of their crime. Which is what he did with the pickpocket when he was identified. Much like himself, the thief had been part of a gang, so Jack branded the ringleader with the letter T for thief on his hand and whipped the others, which you think would give him flashbacks. During his time as a hangman, Jack carried out executions galore. Roll up, roll up, come see the man with imminent crippling PTSD. 
he supplemented his income with a nice little sideline in pawning off the condemned people's clothing. In the market for a blood-stained blouse? Maybe some shoes with a little pre-execution nervous vomit on them? Then get down to Jack's soiled clothing emporium. With his relatively handsome income, Jack himself would don fancy hats, wigs, clothes, cloaks and shoes. He was very suited to this profession and was described as having impudence in abundance, cruelty at his finger ends, drunkenness to perfection and could swear as well without book as within. Sounds like my old maths teacher. This notoriety would be his downfall, however, as the top brass had had enough of his arrogance. He was fired and had no choice but to go back to thieving. But luckily, he was pretty decent at it, so managed to make a not-so-honest living for himself and Betty, who had held down her job throughout. After losing his job, Jack spiralled into a ball of anger and would have drunken brawls almost daily. He missed his work and the status that had come with it. One evening, he was making his way over Bun Hill Fields, pissed on cheap ale as usual, when he met an old woman named Elizabeth White. She was known locally as a mild-mannered watchman's wife who sold pastry ware about the streets. Seemingly unprovoked, he violently assaulted her, breaking one of her legs and stabbing her in the stomach. Two men passing heard the attack and found Jack beating the woman. When they pulled him off her, Jack spat at and cursed them, but they secured him and carried him to a watch house in Old Street, where a couple of watchmen were sent to take the old woman to a doctor. Jack was, once again, sent to Newgate, but there would be no opportunity to pay his way out this time. Once sober, he was surprised at his actions and concerned for Elizabeth White's well-being. Unfortunately, his assault on her had been so severe that she died a couple of days later. He was tried and condemned to death for the second time in his life. Following his conviction, any shame he had melted away, and he became even more obnoxious and ill-mannered than he was before. Jack spent his remaining days awaiting execution in Newgate, intoxicated with Geneva, a disgusting-sounding old-timey drink made of something that sounds like whiskey, blended with something that sounds like vodka, then infused with juniper, which sounds a bit like gin. It'll put hairs on your chest and probably dissolve right through your stomach lining. And on Saturday, the 31st of May, 1718, Jack took a bottle of this gut rot with him, swigging away as he rode the wagon to his execution place. The residents of Bunhill Fields, where he had committed the murder, had wanted to see him hanged at the scene of the crime, and their request was granted. Aged 40, Jack Ketch was taken by the method he had so enjoyed inflicting on others. Before being hanged, he was asked if he had any final words. He refused to utter even so much as a prayer. And that's it. Thank you so much for listening. Sweet dreams.